And thanks for tuning in. Uh, we are uh, doing something a little bit special today. I am not going to take a lot of time to, uh, to, for the introduction. I want to bring my friend and my brother, Mike Williams, up onto the platform. He's going to be sharing with us today. Uh, Pastor Ruben and Andreza, uh, several years ago, made their way on a missions trip to the Dominican Republic, and God just did a real work in their lives. They came back from that trip talking about the fact that they may make a move there, and over the course of that time, they've made multiple trips, and the Lord has opened the doors, stirred their hearts, and so on January 7th, they're, uh, they're going to be making that move with their daughter, Leah, and we don't ever want to forget that Leah is making that sacrifice to go with them, uh, and so she's making that move. Their two boys are in college. They're men. They're making it on their own now, uh, but the three of them, uh, Pastor Ruben, Andreza, and Leah will be going to the DR, and so there are just a a lot of ways that we can be involved. Uh, that's prayer, uh, that's uh, social engagement, even showing up on trips there, uh, and financially. And so their director, uh, Mike, is going to come, and he's going to share with you guys a little bit about the work there. And then immediately following service, we have a meal prepared for you. And if you'll hang out, get some free food, sit around with us for a little bit, we're going to hear a little bit about the specifics of what Pastor Ruben and and Miss Andreza need, and then we'll get you guys out of here. But if you guys will right now, welcome Mike Williams to the stage. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Thank you. Well, first of all, good morning. Good to be with you this morning. Thank you for coming out. I know it's a Sunday morning. I know it's early. Uh, I know the folks, there's folks watching online. We're so grateful that you're here today. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speak to the church people today. So maybe you're a, fo a person right now and you're going, I don't know whether I'm in or out right now. Glad you're here. You listen in. I'm, I'm speaking to the family a little bit uh, today. Uh, and we're glad that uh, you are here. We're glad that the family is here. Uh, I, I want to say to uh, my, my new family that's getting ready to go to the Dominican Republic, I'm excited for you. I remember when my wife and I got on that American Airline plane uh, 12 and a half years ago. Went down absolutely scared to death. But I'll tell you right now, it's the greatest decision we made in our life. Our kids look back on it now and they say, well, they, they, it, 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 I'm not saying it was easy, but they would tell you now the greatest uh, event in their life uh, outside of their Christian faith was to be able to go down there and to interact and become an international. And so you have quite an international church here. I was looking at your, your, your band up here. I mean, you're, you're pretty diverse here. Um, it, it, do me a favor this morning. Would you pray with me this morning? Father, would the joy of the Lord be on our faces because it's in our heart. Father, may we hear from you uh, this morning because we listen. Father, may this be more than just a uh, moment of, of waiting and, uh, for, for a lunch. May this be a moment of, of, of listening with our whole hearts that we might become peace, that we might have success in our life. Because you moved and we said yes. And it's in the name of Jesus Christ I pray. Amen. Before I get started, let me tell you, I've been up since 2.30. Now, you, somebody say why. Yeah, uh, brother, what am I doing? Bend the microphone. Away from my face. There, right there. Is that better now? I'm sorry. I, I apologize. The microphone was too close to my face. Right there. <laughs> I think the problem is the face. Can I be honest with you? Okay. You know, right? I have a face for radio. All right. Um, now, last night I got up at 2.30. Ask me why I got up at 2.30. Why? Because I got a phone call. You ever get a phone call in the middle of the night? Okay? And, and they always scare you because you're thinking, who would call 2.30 unless it's an emergency? So you're going, oh boy, what happened? You start to run through all the family members that you know are on the brink, you know, right there. And uh, it was not that. I was excited. It was a guy. It was not a good connection. And he said that he had gotten my name uh, from something that I'd put in a while back. And he was a producer. And so um, he said, all right, now, uh, I'm going to start us, and I'm going to record us. I know that you're recording. Oh, no problem right there. He said, now, you can't stop. You have to answer straight through. If we stop for any reason, you, you, you don't make the time, and you won't be on it. I said, go for it. He said, all right, we're counting in. I heard a beep right there. He goes, 
All right, uh, Mr. Williams, thank you for being part of our test today. Question number one, what is your ma mother's maiden name? And I said, Johnston with a T. He said, all right, what is the last four digits of your social security number? I read him off the whole thing. I mean, I didn't want to miss it at all. And he said, question number three, uh, what bank do you bank at? And I read Citrus and Chemical Bank, Bartow, Florida, right there. Boom. And, he, and so he said, perfect. I passed. And so I'm excited. He said, probably within the next two weeks, I would know something to do with that phone call. Um, you are the slowest morning group I've ever been with in my life, right there. It was a joke, people. It was a joke, right there. I was being said. Let's move along to the word this morning. How about that? If we do it that way, maybe that'll work better. Um, hey, I, I, I want to read to you a scripture. In fact, I want to read four scriptures to you today. Uh, the first one's found in Luke chapter 4. And I'll bet you'll know it when I speak it out. Jesus is in the synagogue, he has been handed the scroll of Isaiah, and he says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. It's a good place to stop real quick. Do you want to know if the Spirit of the Lord is upon you? Listen to what Jesus said. The Spirit of the Lord is be upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel, good news, to the poor. All too often in those day and age, it was only the elite that got to hear the blessings. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and the recovery of sight to the blind. You ever thought about what that might exactly mean? For us, it was a young lady by the name of Joanne my uh, children, when we went to the Dominican, my daughters were the youngest, three and five years old. And uh, they used to have this thing every Thursday, um, and often on Tuesday, called British Thursday. Did you ever play British Thursday at your house? My daughters would spend the entire day speaking with a British accent. And they would say, wake up in the morning, and they would say, cheerio, mommy, cheerio, poppy, how are you today? And we would say, fine. And they'd go, what are we having for breakfast? I hope we're having scones. They didn't even know what scones were, but they knew it was British. And they would speak that way. And they would always have on that day, they would always have British tea. And they would sit down in the living room. And they had little plastic cups and little plastic saucers. And they would pretend to have tea. And they would hold their fingers out like that because that's the way they saw people from Britain do. And they would hold it out, and they would sit there. They had no tea. They had no scones. They had no biscuits, but they would pretend. And on this particular day, I was out on the motorcycle. My wife was out washing the laundry, which is about uh, 200 foot from our house. There were the little condo building we were staying at, the apartment building that we were in at the time. And a young lady walks by, and they said, oh, cheerio, lass. And they ran out, and they grabbed her, and they brought her into our home, and they sat her down on the floor, and they said, you must have tea with us. And she obliged them. She spoke English. She was Haitian, but she spoke English. And she sat down and began to play with my daughters. And a few minutes later, five, ten minutes later, I walked in the door and realized that the girl sitting on the floor with my three- and five-year-old daughters was a prostitute. I don't know if you've ever come home to find a prostitute sitting with your children. Shortly after I walked in the door, my wife walked in the door. We weren't prepared for that, Reuben. That wasn't our background. We, 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 didn't, we didn't go to school for, to be missionaries, okay? We just knew God had called us to go there, and we went there. We knew that God had called us to go help these girls, but we were brand new on the field. We didn't have experience yet, and all of a sudden, one's in our house, not just in our house, but sitting down, playing unattended with our children. Joanne came by a lot for that next week. She came by on Saturday because we always had cake Saturday where my girls would bake cake. And we had brownie Fridays where my girls would make brownies. We didn't know quite what to say, how to speak into her life. 
there she was. And then it was a, a day that was kind of a, um, hard to put together, uh, but I was leaving. I was headed out. My wife and my children were gone in our van. They were out someplace. And so I'm leaving the compound, and I'm on my motorcycle, and it's about a mile from where we were at our apartment out to the main road. It's a dangerous mile. It's a mile where people will come out and take baseball bats and hit you and knock you off your motorcycle, steal your motorcycle, or worse yet, they'll come out with a machete. It's a dangerous end. And so I'm driving down. You drive down, you're looking constantly to see what you might have to avoid or turn around. There are certain places in a lot of cities where you don't want to be at certain times. And I get halfway down that road, and there is this young girl. Her name is Joanne. And there she is. She's walking down this road, this dangerous road. Uh, but now I'm in a situation. She shouldn't be out there, but I'm by myself. It's not like my wife is with me. I'm kind, of, I'm kind of in a sneaky situation. Uh, I didn't know what to do. Uh, to be honest with you, I'll be real honest with you. I thought about picking up my phone and putting it to my ear and pretending like I didn't see her. Have you ever done that? You ever used your phone to get away with that? You ever, you ever, I, I have before. You ever have your phone ring when you're pretending you're on the phone with somebody else? Okay, that, that's embarrassing. Always embarrassing. But I didn't. I stopped. Hello, Joanne. Hello, Mike. Uh, Joanne, I know you're not from here. See, she was staying with a guy by the name of Harry at her house. I know you're not from here, but uh, you shouldn't be out on this road by yourself. It's too dangerous for you to be out here. And she said, I, I just, I have to get to Sasua. I have to get to Western Union. I'm hoping there may be some type of message for me. <sighs> Joanne, would you like a ride? That's how the prostitute got to be on the back of the missionary motorcycle, in case you're wondering. <laughs> now, I know probably here in Savannah, um, if someone saw a minister or pastor go by on a motorcycle with a prostitute on the back, people just go, he has a heart for those people heart for those people. But I'm going to tell you, even in the Dominican, it can be a judgmental situation. And some of you have already in your hearts and your minds, you've gone, he just should have done something different. He shouldn't have done that. <laughs> now let me say this. The motorcycle I had had a luggage rack on the back of it. She sat very far back. She sat on the luggage rack. I, of course, was as far forward on the motorcycle as I've ever been in my life. I felt like I was riding a motorized unicycle, okay? There we go. Half mile to the end of the road, mile down to Western Union to where she's going. I drove. Just before I got to Western Union, I stopped. And I pulled over to the side in front of a medical clinic. And Dreza, we didn't know how to talk to her. We were still new. I, I, I said, Joanne, I don't know you. I don't know your life. I'm in no way judging you. But I want you to know that my wife and I came here to the Dominican Republic in part to rescue girls. I said, I just want you to know this building over here is a medical clinic, and my wife and I laid the very first blocks on this building. We helped build this building. Inside is a young lady by the name of Angelica Cordero, and if you go in there, if you need anything, you go in there, and she'll take care of you. I'll bet she'll be the next person to see the doctor. We didn't know what to say at that time. I didn't know how to communicate. I didn't know what spoke to hearts and that. We're just trying to do what we knew how to do. And all of a sudden, the emotions broke. And Joanne, this bright, professional-looking girl, started weeping. And she told us her story. She said, Mike, I wasn't always what you see today. She said, I grew up in the wealthy uh, part, the, the upper middle class in Haiti. We were up on the mountain. And, and life was good. And, and I'm educated. I, I speak English as well as you do. And, and she did. 
And she said, but the earthquake came. How many remember hearing about the Haitian earthquake? Do you remember that? Okay, we were in the Dominican during the Haitian earthquake. Uh, the Dominican fault line that had that particular earthquake started in Laogon, Haiti. The Laogon fault line runs from Laogon, Haiti to Sousa, Dominican Republic. And when that earthquake shook there, it shook buildings in our area, the Dominican Republic. We lived at the bottom floor of a three-story apartment building at the time. And when we did, the, the light in the kitchen swung back and forth and crashed up against the ceiling right there. It was powerful. She said, the earthquake came and my house collapsed and I was the only one to get out alive. She said, my, my, my mother and my sisters, I listened to them for three days, die under the rubble. That's got to do something to you. She said, I couldn't get to them. I couldn't get help. Everybody else was trying to dig out their families. I, I was the only one. She said, I got out with a T-shirt, a pair of shorts, and I found a pair of flip-flops. That's, that's all I had. And, and I, I didn't know what to do. And, and, uh, but then the men from Port-au-Prince, what are now the gangs that you hear about on TV, were coming up there, and they were trying to break into the homes. And they were out there. They were trying to break in. They weren't trying to help anybody. They were trying to find valuables that were in these wealthy homes. And she said, and when they were coming, up, they were raping the girls. And she said, I, I knew I couldn't stay. It took her 12 days to get to Sousa, Dominican Republic. She came to Sousa because she remembered that her mom had a friend in Sousa, and she remembered her mom's friend's name. And she said, I walked for 12 days. I drank out of puddles. I'm not used to drinking the water in the Dominican. That'll, that'll make me sick. That'll kill me. I, I can't drink that. I drink out of puddles, and I would try to pull fruit off trees. 12 days of, of avoiding the police and staying off of the trail. And, and she finally made it, and she said, I was just so hungry, Mike. She said, I started knocking on every door in town, going door to door to door. Do you know this lady? And asking, do you know this lady? Do you know this lady? And nobody knows her, Mike. I can't find her. She goes, your neighbor, Harry, pulled up in his big Nissan Armada, and he was known for this. Every two weeks, he would bring in girls He pulled up in his big Nissan Armada, and she said he had two other Haitian girls in the back. She said, I knew what they were, speaking of working girls. And she said, Mike, he rolled down the window, and he said, you look hungry. And she said, Mike, I was just so hungry. She said, I knew I shouldn't get in the car with him, but I did. And look at me now. Tears are running down her face. Pastor, the words that I'll never forget her saying is she said this. She said, I used to teach Sunday school at the Baptist church. And I used to be in the choir. And she said, look at me now. And that's when everything changed for me. About my opinion of her and who she was. And at that moment, she no longer was a prostitute. At that moment, she was a daughter. She was broken. She was someone who was held captive. She was someone who was blinded. Her, her world had been traumatized. And we had to do something about it. And Jesus says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, and he hath anointed me to preach good news, hope, hope. It's such a powerful thing to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and the recovery of sight to the blind. Let me read to you out of John chapter 14, verse 12. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do, you shall do also, and greater works than these, because I go unto my Father. It was probably six or eight months later, we began to go out onto the streets of Sousa, Dominican Republic, 
It's a, it's a town that is overrun with trafficking. In fact, it's considered, uh, the, there's two main trafficking hubs in the Dominican Republic, Sisua, where we live, and Wondolio, the south side of the island there. It, the, the trafficking is controlled, uh, the high-end trafficking is controlled by Russians. How many have heard of them? Raise your hand. Okay. About 70% have heard of the Russians. That's good. Very good. Very good. You turn on the news. These are Russians that made a deal with the Dominican government, and 15,000 of them were allowed to emigrate, and they control the trafficking in our town. And we started going out on the streets. In fact, uh, uh, Carmen, you've been out on the streets with us. You know what we do. We meet these girls who are walking around trying to sell themselves so that they can eat. They're not out there because they want to be out there. They're out there because they're hungry. They're out there because their parents have sent them out there. They send out girls that are as young as 11 and 12 years of age. Why? So that they can have some food for the family. Okay? That's what they do. And we go out there and love them. I remember one night, uh, we were just coming around that, that busy corner where I say we don't stop right there at that busy corner because it's too busy right there and there's too, many, too much influences of noise and things like that. And as we're coming around that corner, this young lady runs up to us. And I, I say young lady, she was probably 39. Depending on whether you're 39 or not, you say young or old, that's up to you. Okay. I thought as I said that, boy, that, that wasn't nice to say right there. She sticks out her hand. She says, you're the Christians I've heard about. Oh, yes, we are. You're the Christians that pray for the girls on the street. Yes, yes, that's what, that's what we do. She goes, I'm so happy to meet you. I'm a Christian. Now, has anybody ever had someone come up to who was a working girl and say, by the way, I'm a Christian? Okay, less than the Russian count. That's good, that's good. And for a minute, when somebody says that to you, you immediately go, oh boy, what am, I, uh, what am I getting into? She tells us her story. Mike, I was an abused daughter. And when I was 14 years old, I just wanted out of the abuse of my alcoholic father and I ran, and sometimes what happens is abusers will walk right into the hands of other abusers because that's the only world they know, and that's what she did. And the, she ends up with this guy, she ends up, uh, he's uh, an alcoholic, he gets involved in gambling, and he gets over his head in gambling, and they threaten to kill him, so what does he do? He brings his wife down for payment and sells her on the streets of Sisua, and there she is with tears running down her face, and this is what she said. I don't know if you want to buy into it or not, not. You can go, it's crazy, it's local, she was all, she was insane, I, but I'm just going to tell you what she said. Here's what she said. She said, he sells me on the street. She goes, I've got four kids now, four different men. I don't even know who the men are that's come from this. i got four kids I'm trying to feed. My husband has left. I've got a third grade education. I can't read or write even at that. This is all I can do. And she said these words that changed the way I felt about the whole situation. She said, Mike, the things I have to do are horrible and sickening, but Jesus comes in the room with me and helps me survive the night. You may go, I wouldn't do that. Let me be honest with you, most of you would lay down your life for your children. She was just laying it down over and over again. Greater work shall you do. Let me uh, read another verse. Put this together here. Acts chapter 1. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and Judea and in Samaria and the uttermost parts of the earth. What a powerful verse. Her name was Jamilka. She was brought to our center. People say, Mike, what, what is Reuben and Andresa going to do down there? What are they going to be part of? 
They're going to be part of helping. They're going to be part of helping girls like Jamilka. Jamilka was 13 when she was brought into our center. She was pregnant. We did some inquiry. We find out that she's pregnant to the neighbor. We find out that mom has been selling her to the neighbor since she was eight years old. It happens. It's around the world. If it hasn't touched your neighborhood, if you don't know where it, 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 it's there. The world is messy. And we've been called to be the salt and the light and to go and help. Christianity is not for those who are faint. We called the HRS, the Dominican HRS, it's called Konani. They got involved. They came back and told us they can't do anything. Why? Well, because uh, the neighbor that has been abusing the child is the lieutenant of our police department. There's nobody we can call. So we've talked to him. He knows what's going on that we know, and we're hoping because he knows it will stop. But that's all we can do. What are Reuben and Andres are going to be doing in the Dominican Republic? They're going to be throwing their arms around girls like this. And they're going to be bringing them hope in Jesus' name. They're going to be your ambassadors. You, you know, as I'm, as, as I'm telling these stories, I, I know that some of you are going, wow, I wish I could be part of that. You have compassion rising up in your heart because that's what Christian people have. We have compassion and we go, I'd like to be part of that. And I want to say today, you don't have to walk away from these stories. I'm here today to encourage you. Um, my best friend in high school, when he was 18, if you'd ask him what he wanted to do with his life, he goes, I don't know what I want to do with my life, but I know one thing I want to do with my life. He said, my goal is to sponsor a missionary family all myself. I want to get to the place where I'm financially well enough that I can sponsor a missionary family on my own. His name was Ken Lash. And you know what? It, it was amazing. When he was 19, he, he bought a car. That was his first gift. He saved up his money. And I know he worked hard. We both worked at the same place. We made $111 a week. Do you remember those days? Those were called the 1980s, okay? Most of you were fetuses during that time. You wouldn't remember that. You usually don't work at that point. Uh, but he saved up and he bought a car. And he kept working and working and working. And I'll tell you what, God blessed him, Pastor. God did a wonderful work in his life. Uh, he, he passed away about three years ago. Uh, but I, I want you to know he passed away a multi-millionaire. And if you were to ask him along the journey, what is the secret to your success? He would say, I believe it's because God gave me a passion to do something for him. Though my calling isn't to go out to the mission field. He said, my calling was to sponsor a missionary. And he did that. He did that. He did that multiple times. He was able to do more and more as God just blessed him. Now, I, I want to read one more, one more verse here. And then, um, now, this, this is Paul reading here. Paul in Philippians chapter 3. Paul says, Brothers, I, I don't count myself as to attain much. But this one thing that I do, I forget the things which are behind me and I reach forth unto the things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. God has not called everyone to the mission field. God has not called every one of you to pack up your bags, come to the Dominican and help with uh, Jamilka or, or Joanne uh, or, or the other girls that we, you've read about in the stories and the books and things like that. That is your calling. That it, it, You're moved by it. You'd like to come and visit. You'd like to help out. But it's not your calling to be there. But God has raised up in your family an ambassador, a representative for you. Now, what I'd like to do today, and I believe this is very biblical. In fact, we find it all through the Pauline epistles. I'm going to ask you if you would allow them to be your ambassadors. 
That doesn't just mean, hey, good job. When I think about you, I'm praying for you. When, I'm, when I think about you, I'm reminding you, reminding God that you're there. I'm saying, I'm going to ask you today to consider making them an ambassador and sponsoring them to be there. It might, it may, might take something. I, I, Mike, are you unfamiliar with inflation? It's up 15%. Uh, you know, in the Dominican, it's up about 75%, so I'm very familiar with it, okay? Uh, I, I spent $14. Um, I was there on Friday. Friday, I flew out. I spent $14 to buy three gallons of gas, okay? That's, I, I understand. But I'm going to ask you to say, you know what? I will allow Reuben and Andresa to be my missionaries, okay? To be my missionaries, and I will support them. It, it might take fasting a meal, fasting a, a, an out meal, but I'm going to ask you today to say, Heavenly Father, can I reach out by allowing Reuben and Andresa to represent me, okay? We're wrapping up today. Um, right here's where you can do it, right there. You can scan that. And you can go on and you can say, you know what, I will be a monthly partner. Now, for those of you who are watching, those of you who are online, you're saying, well, they're all about money. No, this is, this is not the normal Sunday, okay? I'm the visiting guy. I'm from out of town. I'm reminding the folks that we have this wonderful opportunity to be involved with changing the world. We have the wonderful opportunity to go into all the world and preach the gospel. And we can do it through friends that we know and love and have served along with us. So please, please. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, right now, everyone in the room is saying, Father, how would you have us involved? How can we be even sacrificially involved in sending people that we could know that there are people on the field every single day representing us in sharing your word, Father? Father, I pray that we would take this very seriously because it is a serious opportunity but Father, I know that as we give, you will return to us and bless us because that's the way you do. Not to give to get, but to give to get so we can give more because that's how you work. Father, we praise your name. Thank you. Thank you for the lives you've given us. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you for allowing me to be here today and speak Amen. on behalf of your name. Mike has another engagement this evening, so he's going to be getting on the road. If you have questions, if you'd like to connect with him, just he briefly will be available in the lobby before he has to head out. Uh, food is coming out. We'll have it on the back tables. We may need to flip a few more. We're going to move very quickly. Please stick around. Uh, uh, if you have kids in Kids Church, go get them and uh, get them get them out of that space so that our volunteers back there can come and hear more about this. And then we're going to have Ruben and Andreza share with you guys a little bit more information on what their needs are and how, listen, we talk about missions projects all the time, right? And we've done a lot. Last year, we helped to open up a orphanage in Kenya. The unique moment we have here is we're taking a family that is ours, that's been a part of our church for years, and we are equipping, empowering, and sending them. And that's that's the that's the, the, the difference here for us as a church. So uh, take a little bit of time today, uh, hear a little bit more about what Ruben and Andres' needs are, and let's help them get established in this ministry in the Dominican Republic. Go ahead, guys. We'll see you back here in just a moment.